Hi, everyone, and welcome to Eyes on Eagles. This is our second installation, and I want to welcome you all here today. I am going to share my screen and show our beautiful intro card here. Hopefully, it'll start working. There it is. So I am Kelly Ripkema. I am the Director of Environmental Education for the Mercer County Park Commission. I welcome you all back. If you were here last month, um, welcome. We have some new content for you, new video. The eaglets are another month older. And if you are joining us for the first time, of course, you are welcome. We are very glad to have you here. Eyes on Eagles is a partner program between the Mercer County Park Commission, the Conserve Wildlife Foundation of New Jersey, the Wildlife Center Friends, with um, some generous funding from PSE and G. So thank you all for coming. We have, uh, in our program today, we'll be giving you an update over um, how the eaglets are doing. Like I said, they are another four weeks older. Um, the footage that you will be seeing is pre-recorded video. It was collected this week, um, uh, com it was collected this past week. The commentary from our expert panelists is live. And um, the video that you will be seeing was collected with a high powered lens. So you will get a really good up close view of the life in the eagle's nest. Um, probably, definitely a much better picture than you would have gotten if you are there at the lake in person. Um, we will be um, conducting some Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions that pop up during this presentation, please go ahead and add them to the Q&A feature of this Zoom webinar. So if you will just look at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see Q&A. Just open that up, it's pretty self-explanatory. Type in your questions and our panelists will be able to take a look at those and do our best to answer as many of those questions as we can. We will not be discussing other nest locations during this presentation, nor will we disclose um, uh, the locations of, of other nests or the specifics of this particular nest, and that's mainly just for the eagle's safety. They are in a very tender time of their life right now. So I'm going to introduce our panelists for today. First, we're going to have Kevin Biney. He is a nest watcher with the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. He'll give us an update on the eagle behavior, give you some pointers on what you can be looking for as we start this video. We also have Christy Othmajvar, who is a park naturalist with the Mercer County Park Commission. And we have David Wheeler, who is the executive director of the Conserve Wildlife Foundation. We're very glad to have them all with us today. And I will go ahead and start rolling that beautiful eagle footage. Let's see here. Going to new share, share with Zoom. Here we go. So you should be seeing some video of the eagles here. I'm gonna start you off at the beginning. Okay, panelists, can you see all that? Yes. Okay, I think that means everyone else should be able to see it too. Fantastic, okay. So, uh, Kevin, would you like to take it away and tell us what we're looking at? Uh, first up, for those who are just joining in, my name is Kevin Biney, and me and my wife are volunteers going on our 12th season for New Division of Fish and Wildlife, the Bald Eagle Project in New Jersey. And we were lucky enough to be assigned uh, five different nests as our time has gone on. And two of them happen to be the Mercer County Parks nest that we watch. So the one we're talking about here now is in Mercer Lake. Uh, everybody knows it from the bike path area over there. Um, you get a pretty good view on it. And before all the COVID kicked in, we were doing eyes on eagles there. 
So now it's another way of giving you guys an update of what's going on if you're out there. Basically, the video you're watching now is of them full grown. They are in their 11th week and they are pretty much going to be doing a lot of flapping and wing exercising through here as you see some breezes come through. What that does is that strengthens their wings and gets them ready to fledge, which will happen in about another week or so. If you're out there at the nest now, you might actually see an empty nest. That's not unnormal. Basically, these guys are sitting in this area, and you can see by her wingspan on how big that nest is just through the video. Uh, normal eagle's wingspan is anywhere from six to eight feet, pending male or female, so when she extends, you can see how big that nest is. But anyway, um, if you're seeing an empty nest out there when you go in the next couple of days, they could be sitting below the nest on different branches that are more in the shade. After sitting in the sun for so long, I don't blame them for hopping down and getting into your uh, shaded area. Because they're all brown and you might have a hard time seeing them through scopes and everything else, it takes a little bit if you're going through all the trees you might actually see them sitting on a branch or you might see moving from them. Parents know where they are. Parents still bring food back to the nest. The little ones still get them, go back to the nest during their time. Um, they're just getting curious and getting braver and getting to points where they're gonna actually start fledging and flying around the lake. So in about another week or so, you will see two Eagles that are not white heads, people might mistake for turkey vultures, but as Christy will tell you later on, the difference in what you're spotting, um, you should start seeing these guys learning how to hunt from the parents and start becoming eagles of their own. That's pretty much what I have <laughs> on their update. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so as, as Kevin mentioned, um, there are a couple of things to look for when you're looking at bald eagles and how to identify a bald eagle versus other um, raptors that may be flying around. So um, the silhouette looks very similar to a vulture when you see them flying overhead. Um, the one thing you want to look for, though, is the difference in shape overall. Um, so the bald eagle will have um, almost like their, their wings are flat across their body like this, uh, whereas the vulture is more of like a V-shape um, as they're flying. Um, the bald eagle actually doesn't get its white head until it's around five years old. Um, so you see here the juveniles in the nest, they're all brown. And they'll continue to be that way um, for at least their first year or two. And then at that point, they'll start getting some a uh, couple of white feathers growing in on their head and tail. Um, and then by the time they're five, then they'll have the full white head and tail. And that's the time that they're also sexually mature and they can actually find a mate and uh, build a nest of their own. Speaking of nests, um, when you're watching the uh, eaglets there spread their wings across, you can just kind of gather how large that nest actually is. Um, so we're probably looking at about eight feet across. The eagle has about a six to seven foot wingspan. Um, and when she stretches her wings out, that nest is wider than her wingspan. So probably eight, nine feet. Um, some of the record nests have been um, two tons uh, in weight. And that's after being used for 34 years. Um, and 10 foot wide and 20 foot tall which is absolutely enormous. Um, so you can think of how big these trees need to be to support such a huge heavy nest. Um, and again, that's after they've come back year after year and use the same nest year after year. Um, Cause they'll come back, they'll rebuild what's already there, reinforce it, make it stronger. Um, and it will progressively over the years get larger and larger. Um, typically eagles will um, do their courtship behavior and nest building about January. Um, and usually by Valentine's Day, they'll start thinking about laying their eggs. Um, there's typically one to three eggs with uh, two being the most common. 
Um, so here we have twins in this nest. So this mama gave, um, uh, she laid two eggs. Um, so we have two lovely babies there. Um, and they'll, they'll be in the nest for about 12 weeks. Uh, incubation, sorry, I'm gonna go back a moment. Incubation is about 35 days. So mom and dad will take turns um, incubating those eggs and looking over them for about 35 days. And then once those babies hatch, they are there in that nest uh, for about 12 weeks. And during that 12 weeks, there's a lot that goes on. Um, they have to get nice, big, strong feet um, so they can grasp onto those branches there so they don't fall out. Um, they got to grow in all of those big, beautiful feathers that they have. And then they got to flap those wings and get those wing muscles nice and strong so they can be ready to fly. So there's a lot that happens in 12 weeks. Um, I'm really excited because I know that when we go out to the site next week and the week after, we'll probably see them flying around uh, and learning how to hunt, which is really exciting. Um, let's see. Okay, so once they fledge, they'll probably spend mm, the rest of the summer um, learning how to hunt and find their own food. Um, sometimes they'll fall around mom and dad, see how it's done, um, and then figure it out for themselves. Um, and then what, once the end of the summer comes, uh, the juveniles pretty much just disperse and go wherever they feel like, wherever the food is, wherever looks fun. Um, they're kind of bachelors, if you will. So they, they just find the best party in town and, and that's where they go and head off to. Um, one other thing that you can look for, um, if you're curious between males and females, uh, males are slightly smaller than females. Um, so you're looking at uh, about a bag of flour, as Kevin likes to say, pick up a bag of flour and you'll, you'll uh, see how heavy they are. Um, and let's see, I, I think that's everything I have. Um, oh, one thing, if you give me one moment, I forgot. My favorite fun fact is their sound. A lot of people think that they make um, the sound that you hear in the old westerns with the uh, hawk flying over the canyon. Ah! That's not how bald eagles sound. They sound very different and you're in for a, a little bit of a surprise here. Um, so let me pull it up here on, on my phone. I'm going to try and turn up the volume, make sure you can hear it. So it's a bit different than uh, you would think, than that you would hear. Um, they also have one other sound that they make. There it is. Very dainty sounding. All right. Um, so one other question I get asked a lot is what are uh, the most common predators to bald eagles? Um, and the answer to that actually is humans. Um, we are the biggest predator in so many different ways. Um, and we've done a really good job over the years of becoming less of a predator in that um, most of us are not going out and collecting them um, there's legal protections, which, uh, Kevin will, uh, I'm sorry, David will cover in a little bit. Um, and, uh, we've done a lot with habitat restoration, stewardship, um, and, uh, removing DDT from the environment. So we've done a lot of things, um, to help, uh, our impact on the eagles. Uh, but there's still a few things that we need to keep in mind. So the biggest thing is we need to stay away from the nests and give them their space. Um, they are very, very sensitive to dis disruptions while they're nesting. Um, and uh, 
lead. Lead is another big one. So um, hunting and things like that, they will um, actually pick up lead and get lead poisoning from lead bullets. Um, so we just need to be aware of the things that we're putting in the environment um, and make sure we give them their space to do the things that they need to do to um, be strong and awesome. Um, all right, uh, David, do you wanna go ahead and cover some of the legal protections and the history of bald eagles? Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll go, thanks, Christy. Um, and so, yeah, to kind of give, uh, give the, a little bit of a context for uh, what we're watching here and, and what uh, Kevin and Christy have talked about, um, the eagle is, is really one of the most magnificent, not only one of the most magnificent creatures, but its recovery is as impressive as just about any animal in the world um, here in North America. Uh, bald eagles, um, before European settlers, bald eagles, they estimate that there were hundreds of thousands, up to even 500,000 bald eagles in North America. And, uh, and by the time of, uh, that the U.S. Uh, formally got established uh, in the 1780s, they still, even then, after uh, settlers had, and the, and the colonies had um, covered so much ground in the, in the eastern seaboard especially, even then there was still well over 100,000 bald eagles, it's estimated. Um, a quick side note, uh, especially as we approach July 4th, uh, the bald eagle, which has always been our national emblem since back then, almost, was, uh, almost uh, came in second place to um, another animal uh, chosen by Ben Franklin uh, to be our national emblem, which was the wild turkey. And uh, old Ben did a lot of smart things, but I think he was a little bit on the, on the wrong uh, side of, of history in that sense. So uh, Bald Eagle fortunately was, was chosen. And, um, but even, even as our national emblem, its numbers continued to decline over the years. It, it uh, you know, fell victim to everything from losing habitat as more and more ground was cleared, losing prey uh, for that same reason, and um, to, to at being actively hunted in some cases. It was, in some areas, it was viewed as a pest or as competing with ranchers or farmers. Um, in Alaska, uh, over 100,000 bald eagles were, were uh, killed in the uh, first half of the 1900s uh, as they were looked at as a direct competitor for salmon. Um, and so, so even through uh, up until the 1940s, uh, eagles were continue, continued to decline, but they still had uh, a sustainable population. That changed after World War II. Um, the chemical DDT, uh, better living through chemistry, uh, did certainly improve a lot of things in terms of crops and, and the yield for our crops across the country and the world. Uh, but the downside uh, quickly became apparent and was raised uh, nationally by Rachel Carson, of course, in her book, Silent Spring, in 1962, which was serialized in The New Yorker and, and read by President Kennedy and, and a number of other decision makers, quickly caught everyone's attention because it was capturing through science what people were observing and maybe not putting together with the widespread use of DDT. What it did was it went up the food chain and in birds, raptors at the top of the food chain, like bald eagles, ospreys, peregrine falcons, it weakened their eggshells to such an extent that it could no longer support the nesting parent's weight. And so we lost entire generations during those years to DDT. And the shame of it was uh, that uh, legal protections had been implemented for bald eagles um, in the years prior to this, but bald eagles were uh, covered initially um, by the Lacey Act in 1900, uh, the 1918 Migratory Bird Treaty with Canada, and, and later we also did similar treaties with Japan and Russia. Um, all of those implemented protections, not just for eagles, but for a number of migratory birds. But in 1940, uh, the Bald Eagle Act, uh, which later they added Golden Eagle as well, so it's now the Bald and Golden Eagle Act, uh, meant, um, implemented very specific protections for bald eagles. And uh, this, this includes, and, and today, today this is still active, it includes everything from not, you're not allowed to disrupt the nest, you're not, certainly not allowed to knock one down, uh, but as uh, Christy mentioned, you're, you're also not allowed to uh, take anything uh, from uh, an eagle. And, and that might be, that could be as little as a feather, it could also be as great as an egg. Uh, so eagles have very specific protection that way. 
Um, and we'll talk a little bit later too about some of the other ways we can we can uh, you know really um, consider their welfare as we're if we ever are approaching a nest in the wild. Um, but so even with these protections, uh, they they accomplished a lot in terms of people directly interacting with eagles, but they couldn't handle the, the impacts of DDT. Um, fortunately, uh, because the decision makers were able to act on this uh, in the um, late 60s and early 70s, they were part of a wave of environmental protections, all of which impacted eagles to some degree. You had DDT outlawed under President Nixon. You also had uh, the Clean Water Act, which uh, greatly cleaned up our waterways over the next few decades. Of course, eagles rely for much of their diet on, on fish and, and healthy water, of course, makes that possible. Um, and then, of course, the Endangered Species Act, for which the eagle was one of the, the bald eagle was one of the main impetus uh, species for the Endangered Species Act. Um, and so these protections uh, gave the eagles a, a fighting chance, but their numbers can continue to decline. DDT was still out there, even though it was outlawed, it was still out there in the, in the ecosystems. Um, so here in New Jersey, by the, the late 70s, we were down to one active nest in the entire state. Uh, in the early 80s, we, we not only had just one active bald eagle nest, but it was a nest that had failed for six straight years uh, and failed in the sense that the eagles laid the eggs, but they just could not uh, see it through to till it could hatch for those same DDT impacts. Uh, and that's where New Jersey Endangered and Non-Game Species Program scientists stepped in. They came up with a really what was a last ditch effort and a, a creative plan, an ambitious plan under duress, uh, they uh, took the eggs when they, they were laid at the one remaining nest, which was down in remote southwestern New Jersey in Bear Swamp, and they brought these eggs down to a wildlife. They replaced them with a, a uh, an artificial egg and replaced them uh, and brought them down to Patuxent Wildlife Lab down in Maryland. And there they were incubated in a way that they could be safe and and uh, by another animal that could uh, incubate them without having the weight that would break the eggshells. That animal was the, the chicken. Uh, so you had uh, these bald eagles basically being incubated by an animal that under better circumstances for the eagle would serve as the eagle's prey. So a very odd kind of uh, semi-natural cycle there. And uh, I'm sure many of the chickens hearing about this would have been pretty displeased to play a part in the eagle's recovery. But nonetheless, eagles, uh, that way we're able to uh, viably hatch. And then uh, scientists brought them in and also reintroduced uh, some birds and did this through hacking. What they did was they built these temporary towers um, in the same region, in the same very remote habitat. And th the birds could essentially live where they can see the wild, they can smell and, and, and all the senses could experience the wild but they were being fed by humans without seeing the humans. So you, you still maintained that separation from humans, but people were able, biologists were able to, to feed them and help them grow to when they could fledge and go back into the wild. They had no idea if this would work, but it did work. Ultimately, eagles started coming back little by little. Our organization, Conserve Wildlife Foundation, partnered with Endangered and Non-Game Species Program about 20 years ago. Right around that time, eagles really started to see their numbers take off. We went from, uh, again, from that one nest, by the year 2000, we were up to 23 pairs in New Jersey. Uh, by 2005, just five years later, it doubled up to 48 pairs. 2010, we were up to 82 pairs. And in those ensuing years, their recovery, not just in New Jersey, but across the country, uh, was so successful that they were re removed from the Federal Endangered Species Act, which was a huge success. There's only been a handful of animals like the bald eagle, the American alligator, and a few others that have been removed from that list because their comeback has been so successful. That didn't remove their state protections. They continue to have the state protections. They continue to have specific protections through that bald eagle act, but they are an endangered species act federally, uh, a success story. Uh, so nonetheless, their, their numbers kept improving. Uh, they were up to 150 by 2015. And uh, in this past year, uh, we saw their greatest numbers uh, yet, uh, 211 pairs in New Jersey, up from one in the early 80s, and had 249 young that fledged. Both of those are records. Those are numbers we've never seen 
uh, reached before in New Jersey, tremendously uh, successful, and uh, really a function of uh, a combination of things, a, a healthy and improving, a healthier and improving environment with cleaner waters and a greater prey base for the eagles, <clears throat> uh, the work of the scientists who made this all possible, and the work of the volunteers. We have uh, over 80 volunteers like Kevin and Karen Biney uh, who are out there, uh, we call them, they, as they refer, referred to them earlier, nest watchers, but it's so much more than that. They're, they're basically, um, from the, the time the eagles build this nest to when the, the birds finally leave and fledge, they're out there gathering data close to daily, several times a week, um, getting data about everything from the specific dates that the eagles build the nest to when the eggs are laid to how many to when the birds uh, start doing all their different behaviors. And so they know these families of eagles more than anybody else. And it's really impressive what they do. So I thank all the volunteers, as well as all the biologists from Conserve Wildlife and the Endangered and non game Species Program who make this possible. <clears throat> and one note uh, for the public in terms of, um, you know, interacting in, in some, so many words with bald eagles, uh, they, they still, despite the recovery, they're still at risk. Um, and what I mean by that is all it takes is uh, disrupting a nest at the wrong time and they could leave that nest. They could, um, you know, and, and basically abandon it. Uh, so that's, that's key. You never want to get too close. You never want to get close enough. And, th and this goes for all wildlife, but particularly with bald eagles. If you're close enough that the animal is re reacting to your uh, presence, that means you're probably too close. Um, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be reacting. And that's why the, the nests at Mercer Lake, the nest at Mercer Lake is so great is that it's across the lake. It, it basically precludes any human interaction except from a safe distance. Uh, the other thing is we're working as, as was mentioned earlier, uh, lead bullets uh, do continue to, you, you think about waterfowl being shot by hunters. If uh, the waterfowl is not retrieved, eagles have a good chance of ending up eating that and then ingesting the lead. Uh, so we're working with a number of sportsmen's groups to try to uh, use much more lead bullets uh, or non-lead bullets, I should say, uh, to try to remove that from the, the ecosystem and the impacts from the bald eagles. Um, beyond that, we're just really excited uh, to see not only this uh, amazing recovery statewide, but here in Mercer County, where um, it really is a microcosm of this great recovery and at the same time so tied in with fascinating people being able to go out and have a chance of seeing a bald eagle when just a few decades earlier, you know, you would have been hard pressed to see that. Okay, David, thank you so much. Um, we are we are pulling up the video. Can you all see the video with the green leaves on it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. So sorry about that, everyone. I think what happened is that the when the this week's video finished, it just rolled on over into last month's video. So we. Um, what you might have been able to see is how uh, four weeks ago, the young were smaller and fuzzier. Kevin, can you talk a little bit about um, some of the differences that uh, people might have noticed? What you would have saw when they, you were looking at the video while David was speaking was they were a little lower in the nest, they were a little smaller, and around their neck area and chest area, you would have seen a lot of gray fuzz going on them. As you can see now in the current video, that's all gone. Their wings have fully expanded. Uh, their height has been hit as what they're going to be, which is normal at about six, seven weeks, they, they reach their full growth. So when you're looking at this pair, the female in this video would be on the right and the male would be on the left. My best guess, just based on size, obviously just based on her wingspan right there too, she's got a bigger wingspan than the, the the eaglet on the left so my guess is that the right one is a female in this particular nest we have one of each okay and feather wise uh true fact that's out there if questions we get all the time bald eagles have up to seven thousand feathers 
if you were to weigh their feathers, their feathers actually weigh more than their bones. Uh, and that's because most of their bones are hollow for flying purposes. Okay. All right, so some folks are having some trouble seeing the video. I'm gonna stop the share and see if I can, if you can all just bear with me a little bit, see if I can get this uh, shared again. So share screen, all right. All right, so I just tried to reshare. Can you all tell me if um, you're seeing the video with the green leaves? I have it. Okay. All right, let me open up the chat. All right, great. Um, so why don't we um, move on over to the question and answer? So panelists, uh, can you um, take a look at some of the questions and and see if um, there are any that we can answer. I have one there asking about the nest that was on the 17th hole. That nest is still there. Uh, they decided not to build in that nest and they've moved to a different part of the golf course area, uh, which you can see from the lake area. That's where they have been the last two years. Okay, and if you are um, answering a question, please go ahead and restate uh, the question so that... Um, Sorry. No, no worries. <laughs> All right, there's a question here about the lifespan of a bald eagle, um, which I did not cover in my talk, so I'm glad that question was asked. Um, so the oldest bald eagle, wild bald eagle on record was a female that lived to be 39 years old. Um, on average, it's probably about 25. Um, obviously, much better um, chances of living longer if they are um, not in the wild. Um, I don't know who would have bald eagles other than zoos and wildlife centers, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's 39 years was the oldest wild female on record. And uh, I, have a, uh, I see a question about um, global warming or climate changes impacts on bald eagles. Uh, bald eagles are a good example of uh, an animal that would be impacted in a secondary way. Um, so in other words, maybe not on the, on the front lines of the impacts of climate change, but more indirectly, if you think about uh, where their prey could be impacted, uh, where um, you might start to see conditions that are no longer favorable for bald eagles. Um, they, they do have such a wide habitat range uh, or a wide range in North America. And you can find them, you know, pretty much across the continent in, in so many different habitats. So they're very adaptable that way. At the same time, though, if you start to see certain uh, prey impacted, which would happen when you start to see things like uh, uh, losing salt marsh, which we're losing at such a, a rapid degree uh, up and down uh, the, the Atlantic coast and, and the uh, Gulf of Mexico, um, as you lose salt marsh, you lose uh, a lot of their, their prey sources uh, and or you see, start to see more and more impacts in, in our coastal waterways. That in turn would impact the bald eagle. So I would, I would put them as a, a real a secondary um, impact from, from climate change and, and certainly something we look out for with, with bald eagles here in New Jersey. Also along that same line, David, um, with their habitats changing, you're gonna start seeing more and more bald eagles finding areas that they normally wouldn't find because habitat is being lost in certain areas. You're gonna find them nesting on top of cell towers. Um, there, there's a reason why improper ethical etiquette that they ask you to stay about a thousand feet away from a bald eagle's nest. And there's a lot of different reasons for it, but mainly is the disturbance of the eagle based on their habitat sometimes of making a nest could be in a neighbor's backyard. Uh, you're along waterways and stuff like that, you're gonna find them. We have plenty of nests that are out in general public areas that we try to protect more than we do if they're out in the wild areas, but they're getting more and more popular and more and more used to humans. So the laws that they have out there for proper eagle etiquette are for a reason. 
Yeah, great point. And and it's interesting too with Eagles in New Jersey. We we've uh, it's been such a learning experience for the scientists who have been studying the Eagles. When back when there was just the one nest in the state, on on some level, scientists wondered, well, uh, is does this mean that Eagles can only nest in an area this remote? You know, so many miles from any uh, real human uh, civilization and impacts. Um, but they, like I said, they have turned out to be adaptable um, and and. As Kevin mentioned, nesting in, in places you would have never ex expected just a, a few decades ago. But that being said, there's still that sensitivity, and uh, and it still comes down to which I think I hope that many people watching this today can really get the sense of what individuals these birds are. Um, you know, it's it's always important as we talk about any wildlife species that there's there's kind of the the collective knowledge of the species, but it still comes down to each individual bird or pair of birds. Uh, they make their own decisions, what they can accept and not when they choose nesting locations, when they choose to see it through. And uh, the last thing we want to do is have it um, literally uh, ruined by just a person getting too close to the nest unnecessarily. And as you can see in the video, when she's, I keep calling her her because she seems to be the bigger in the nest, she's slapping her wings and she's trying to strengthen her muscles if she's in a nest and happens to be caught by a wind that comes through, she could get taken over the edge and either land on a branch below, or I have seen them to where they have landed on the ground. Having people around there does not help the parent go down there and try and figure something out for them. Um, so it's very critical time of the year when you see stuff like this going on at a nest, but you're very, we're very protective of the nest and you're very observant of trying to stay away as much as you possibly can. And I keep watching the video and I'm always struck with, you know, what a learning curve that must be to manage those giant wings um, that are permanently attached to your body like, you know, a hang glider. And, you know, what that must be like to all of a sudden get hit in the face with a gusty wind. And, and if you don't know what to do with it, you know, You've got to learn really fast. Uh, there's a question on there. Somebody had asked, have you considered putting a live cam on the nest? The nest that was <laughs> on the Mercer Lake golf course, we did put a camera on uh, with great donations from PSENG. And they decided not to, to use that nest the following season. We put it in <laughs> for the off season. They decided to move trees away and then decided to have twins. So it is in talks to take that camera down from that nest and move it to the current location at the Mercer Lake area. Uh, hopefully we will be lucky enough to do that and we will be live with it next year to be able to watch the camera, to watch this nest. Yeah, and any kind of, uh, any kind of nest cam, whether for eagles or for any other nesting birds, uh, all, everything has to be done in the off season um, so as to not disrupt uh, you know, their nesting, obviously. <laughs> so. That, that's that's our hope, as Kevin mentioned. That's what we, we hope we can uh, do. It, it does depend on so many other things, you know, the, um, the, the strength of the tree uh, to handle it, the likelihood of the eagles returning. Uh, there's a lot of variables and probably the, the first and foremost variable, as Kevin mentioned, you know, the eagles, it's their call. We're just, we just go along for the ride, but ultimately they're the ones who make the decisions. So um, I do see another question as well about um, if, in, if you ever saw an eagle that needs help, maybe an, a bird that looked like an injured bird, um, maybe along uh, the highway as you're driving or in some way that looks like it, it, it can use help. Uh, best thing to do is call 1-877-WARN-DEP, as in Department of Environmental Protection, 1-877-WARN-DEP. Uh, for any kind of at-risk species, uh, it's best to reach out to them and then they can either send out or, or get in touch uh, with uh, experts from so many organizations around the state who have uh, that expertise in the, with that given species uh, to then go check on it. There's another question here um, asking about how far do eagles usually travel from the nest? Um, and I'd like to answer part of that, but I'd also like to get Kevin to um, give the story of the lady who was uh, rehabilitated and re-released. Um, but eagles are very nomadic. 
um, outside of the nesting season. They come and go as they please. Um, they go where the food is. They go where the party is. Um, eagles that live further north, um, obviously uh, during the winter time, freezing over of water bodies is a big issue because that's where most of your food is. Um, so they will come further south. And actually a couple of years ago when we first discovered the eagles nesting at Mercer Lake, um, this is how we, we discovered it because I was out there on a balmy uh, January uh, day. Uh, the lake was almost completely frozen over except for one tiny little like open ice hole in the middle. And all the way down at the other end of the lake, there were two dozen bald eagles of uh, various different ages, all perched in the same tree. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Never seen so many bald eagles in one place. Um, and since we saw that, uh, we started going back out periodically to, you know, see what was going on, make some observations. And that's when we discovered uh, the nest that was there. Um, so, uh, Kevin, can you share the story about uh, the rehabilitated lady? There was a bald eagle that basically she got kicked out of her nest by another female. She was found on the ground. She was rescued. She had some injuries and she was rehabbed. And instead of taking her back to her nest area to where she can possibly try and take back her nest or uh, get into another fight and get injured, they took her north. And when I say they took her north, they took her almost to the Canadian border in order to release her, figuring that was going to be enough space to where she can just say, okay, I'm gonna start on my own and do this. She decided after they released her three days later, she was back at that nest that was hers. She reclaimed it. Unfortunately, that female did not survive that time. Um, so the rehab one got released and came back to her nest and reclaimed it. The sad part about that is, is that the male was none the wiser. He took on the new female. And when his old female came back, I'm pretty sure he had a lot of questions to answer. But he basically <laughs> just reaccepted her back. <laughs> So they are, if you mess with them, they are resilient enough to take back what is theirs. <laughs> there was a question somebody asked about whether or not um, helicopters, jets, or drones bother eagles. When you're talking about jets and you're talking about helicopters and aircraft, they have nests that are around airports they don't consider that to be a threat. They get used to the noise. Uh, there's one in Bordentown, has a river running, runs past it all the time, never bothers them at all. When you talk about drones, if you're sending up a drone to an eagle's nest during nesting season, that is considered to be, um, what's the proper word, David? Um, Disturbance. Yes, thank you. You're, you're in disturbance of the nesting season, so it is illegal to send up a drone to a nest that is active and being raising of young. I, I see a, a somewhat related question too about eagle protection, uh, different programs for that. Um, here in New Jersey, uh, our organization, Conserve Wildlife Foundation, uh, working closely with the, the state endangered and non-game species program, uh, we lead the efforts to protect and and help recover bald eagles here in New Jersey. And as I mentioned, the volunteers are such a key part of that. And just to give uh, a little more detail on what that entails, in addition to all the data that the volunteers collect for every known nest in the state, um, we also, whenever possible, uh, it was more challenging this year, obviously, but uh, in past years, especially as eagles were in the earlier stages of their recovery, we tried to ban um, as many bald eagles as we can, young bald eagles before they fledge the nest, uh, whenever possible, we would try to ban them. And we would put on two 
different bands, one a, a, a state, one a federal band with a very unique number. And what that does is it gives us information uh, that a, a photographer, if a photographer gets a really good photo of a uh, eagle anywhere in the country, and we can read that band, um, we then will know, we can find out where that eagle uh, comes from, what was its, its nest that it was born and raised in, and then that's one more piece of data wherever it was cited, because they, they will be seen you know, many, many states away at, at different times of their lives. Um, at the same time, uh, as eagles recovered more and more, we could no longer ban every eagle, but we still try to do strategically ban them. And a few times when there's been funding available, we've also used GPS uh, transmitters that give us more real time, uh, daily or even more frequent signals that allow us to track them. And those have always been eye openers because you can literally follow their uh, their their flight, you know, from somewhere. We had two at one point. We had two eagles released very soon uh, here in New Jersey. One flew north into Canada. One flew south into Florida. And yet a year later, they were within a mile of each other down by Forsyth Refuge back in New Jersey. So it, it, always a, a, an incredible learning experience. Uh, the more we're able to get this information about each individual bird. Uh, someone had asked the question of the eagles left the golf course nest because of the golfers. No, they did not. Um, they had a couple of different reasons and theories of why they might have left that nest, one being the camera itself. But when the camera went live at the time watching the nest, if anybody watched it in the off season, they would have seen a lot of different aged eagles using that nest. Um, just for all kinds of different things, stopping in there, or bringing a new meal in themselves. And we think that is the main reason why they left that nest was because of the fact that they felt like it was not their own and they felt like they might've been intruded on and that's why they built a new one. It had nothing to do with the golfers because once that area leafed out, golfers didn't even know it was there. Kevin, in the video, we just reached the section where both of the eaglets um, do some projectile pooping. Could you, <laughs> could you address that um, and you know explain you know, theories on why they do that? And is that something common to raptors? Uh, basically, yes. And you'll, it's, if you're ever, and you shouldn't be, but if you're ever under an eagle's nest or an area, you're going to happen to see what we call whitewash down on the ground or down on the leaves. Or if you're actually watching through a spotting scope like you should be, uh, you might see white areas on branches of the trees. Basically, you're not going to poop where you eat. So from an early age, if you ever watch any of the eagle cams, you will see them turn butt out and poop. Uh, a lot of times they do that. Adults you'll see do that before they're about to fly. Uh, but mainly it's just like a human. It's got to go somewhere when it comes in. It's got to go out. They do not make the pellets like you see in owls. Um, basically most of their stuff is turned to liquids, uh, and that's what you see kind of coming out of them. I had another question, if I, if I might ask, uh, David, um, when you were going over the history, uh, you mentioned how, um, you know, there was just one, one pair of eagles left at one point. Um, and then we had the Endangered Species Act come and uh, scientists started hacking. Um, I'm wondering what, what was the time span? Like when, when we started to see this growth in the population, how much of that was due to the benefits of the hacking versus just the DDT working its way out of the system? Do we have any sense of that? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, so the the hacking and the uh, incubation that was done, the artificial incubation, that was done mostly through the 80s. And so, you know, a, a good way to look at it, that was the infancy of the recovery. That was when you were going from, you know, one for most of the first half of the 80s up into, you know, incrementally each year. Um, 
it, it then the, the comeback really began to go exponential during the 90s. So it was after that, in a sense, gave it uh, a foothold from which then they could recover uh, more naturally. And DDT that also gave that that many more years, another, say, 10 years for DDT to clear itself more of the uh, clear as much as it can uh, out of the system. Uh, so that combination, yeah, that gave it its its kind of head start. And then uh, all those pr protections that have been implemented and maybe where we couldn't see the benefits because of the impacts of DDT, and, and I'm referring to the protections of the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Water Act, the, you know, the improving uh, water and prey base, uh, all of those then, in a sense, the stage was set for once, once we gave them that head start, the stage was set for the uh, more exponential recoveries to take, take hold. To touch base really quick on what David's saying about the hack towers too, when they were used in New Jersey, they are still being used out there. And just to get quickly off of uh, New Jersey, there's a place down in Tennessee called the American Eagle Foundation that takes in all kinds of rescued eagles that can't be released in the wild. Those rescued eagles pick mates and they separate them to mate up themselves. After about six or seven weeks, their young are taken and put into the hack towers down in Tennessee lakes to be released. So even though those mating pair cannot be released back in the wild themselves, the hack tower system is still being used out there and bald eagles are still being able to be released that old fashioned way of what we used to do in New Jersey to get our stuff jump started. Yeah, and to, to uh, give it a little more perspective too, uh, across the East Coast, um, just where does New Jersey stand? You know, we've talked about our recovery and uh, nationally estimates have it from around 15,000 to 18,000 eagles now. Still a fraction of its uh, pre-colonial numbers, but, but certainly night and day from a few decades ago. Uh, but New Jersey, uh, it, here in the state, uh, roughly half of our, our existing nests, our active nests, are in the broader Delaware Bay uh, area of, uh, you know, Cape May, Cumberland, and Salem, Gloucester counties. Um, it's, it's one of the most remote parts of the state along the coast there, and just tremendous habitat. Uh, and and that uh, that area is considered the second uh, most prevalent eagle population on the East Coast, right after the Chesapeake region of uh, Maryland and Delaware and Virginia. Uh, so it really is uh, New Jersey really is playing a uh, a key role in the eagles' recovery nationally, even beyond our own borders. Somebody had asked a question on how do you put the bands on the eagles. Um, basically, when an eagle hits six or seven weeks old, and that's the job of the monitors to be able to tell our biologists when that time frame happens, that's why we're out there monitoring. Um, it can be done in a couple of different ways. Either a climber would actually climb the tree, or we have had assistance from PNC and G before with bucket trucks. Basically, they go up, they take the eagles down, because at that age, there's no chance of them to be able to fly off or even hop off the nest to a branch. Uh, and at that age also their legs are fully grown to the point where uh, if we were to place a band on them, it would not restrict growth at all. They're basically taken down to the ground. They're looked over by one of our senior biologists, our senior New Jersey vet. And at that time they're examined and then that's when they have their bands placed on them uh, basically riveted on there. A lot of people might think that that's a disturbance of the nest and the parents, but what comes out of it is very useful information. Um, short story, we had an eaglet that was left its nest in the Monmouth County area, was found on the ground with an injured leg. Uh, they were able to rehab it, they banded it before it left. And a year later, they found it actually at the Mercer Lake during one of the winter. So they were able to tell at that point that that eaglet was able to make it out there. So disturbance of the nest doesn't take that long. It's a very quick process, uh, but what you, the information you can get out of it is very useful. Yeah, and, and there, I saw a couple of questions uh, relating to that uh, about threats to the nest. And uh, in terms of other animals, um, the, the biggest threat is great horned owls. 
uh, for young eagles. The uh, great horned owls are a very effective predator um, and certainly pose a risk to young eagles. Uh, if anyone has watched the, the eagle cam that we operate in tandem with Duke Farms, um, you may have seen, and if not, it's, it's on, uh, very popular on, on YouTube, uh, is a um, clip of a red-tailed hawk swooping into the nest to try to attack a young eagle, uh, even with the parent right there. And uh, the parent eagle made very short work of that red-tailed hawk. It was not one of the brighter decisions that that hawk ever made. So yeah, not as big a threat uh, as much as uh, gold, uh, great horned owls. Uh, and, and eagle parents are very protective, um, tremendously dedicated and devoted uh, to their young. And um, in terms of uh, even when we band, uh, they always stay nearby. Um, they, you know, they, they certainly are, are, they appear concerned and the whole banding process uh, moves as quickly as possible. Because um, one of the things we also check for also, I've seen a couple questions about this, is the, the health of the eagles. There's, uh, we have a licensed specialist uh, for the state who um, basically uh, checks their health for a number of different uh, conditions and, and, and things to look out for, checks their weight and, and different dimensions, um, as well as the banding itself, which is simply, um, I saw a question about what does that entail? Basically a clamp is used to uh, safely put the band around their lower leg in a way that doesn't interfere with uh, any of the, their activities. Um, and and in doing so is basically as inobtrusive as possible. I think we have time for two more questions. Uh, I'm gonna hop question? on and answer a question because I haven't in a while. Yeah, <laughs> There's yeah, one that I saw a little ways back. Um, asking about the shape of the nest and why it's conical. Mm -hmm. um, and we didn't really talk about um, the uh, architecture of the nest. And the architecture of the nest actually is extremely important, especially if they're going to come back and use it year after year and it's going to get enormous and heavy. Um, so it's conical in shape because if you see the bottom of the nest is kind of wedged in between um, two large limbs of the tree. Um, and that's the base, um, base support. And then they have to build this bowl shape, if you will, so that those eggs, and when they become little eaglets, the eaglets don't roll out of the nest. This tree is very high up in, in the canopy. Um, and if those babies roll out, there's no way to get them back in. Um, and they can get really hurt. So it's very important to um, the eagles to be able to build a strong and safe nest for their babies. Um, so inside that nest, there is, there is an impression, um, uh, a bowl inside um, to keep those babies safe inside. Right now, we're looking at um, the eagles um, that are almost ready to fledge. So they are standing kind of on the edges of it, if you will, so we can kind of see more of the bottom part of their bodies because um, they're not necessarily in the center. Um, that center is usually lined with really soft materials, mosses, feathers, those types of things um, to keep it nice and soft and padded. Um, so there's the nest question. What, um, can you help us put, you know, what we're seeing in perspective? I mean, I, I see lots of, you know, twigs woven together. Can you give us an uh, idea of just how large those twigs are? Yeah, so um, those really aren't twigs. <laughs> those are branches. <laughs> um, so if you can imagine that eagle's wingspan is about seven foot across. And that seven foot across um, doesn't even cover the whole length of the nest. So some of those twigs are, twigs slash branches are, about half the length of the nest. And if this nest is about nine foot across, we're probably looking at four and a half foot long branches. So let's see, I am five foot four. So some of those branches are probably almost as long as I am tall. Um, just to give you an idea of the impressive size of, of this nest. 
And like, what would you say, like maybe two inches in diameter or something? One to two inches? Oh, at least. <laughs> at least. Yeah. At least. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And they're okay. very precise in terms of where they put them too, right? I, I know, uh, they, you know, they, they certainly have, have a plan in mind, the way they lay them all out. And you, you can watch eagle cams, and it is funny in the beginning to watch the nesting season because it's all about the placement of a stick. He's putting it somewhere. He wants it someplace different. She moves it again. It, it's very particular on how, how sticks get placed in this nest, and I've seen them woven around more support branches, which is just intricate to watch them do. <laughs> All right, now with that, I think we have to wrap it up. We promised you a one hour program. If any of you still have uh, some burning questions, we do wanna honor that. So um, please go ahead and email those questions to us at natureprograms at mercercounty.org and we will make sure that uh, you get an answer to those questions. I'm going to stop that share and switch back over to our slideshow here. Is it gonna work? <laughs> I'm having technical difficulties today. <laughs> I know if you turned if you tuned in last time you saw this amazing photograph from Kevin Biney, but I wanted to show it again. Um, thank you to David, Kevin, and Christy for your commentary. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we want to remind you that there is a weekly Eagle blog on both the Conserve Wildlife uh, Foundation of New Jersey website, and there's also a link at the Mercer County Park Commission website. It has updates daily. And as these eaglets, you know, actually start branching and fledging, there's gonna be a lot of information on that coming up. So um, I encourage you to go ahead and tune into that. We have um, also, we're running some wildlife lecture series, which are uh, webinars similar to this one. Um, the next one is coming up soon. It's on Tuesday, June 16th. It's at 7 p.m. And it's about urban coyotes. Coyotes are present in Mercer County. I've seen them myself in Lawrence. There are also some in Hamilton that are making um, an appearance. We're bringing in uh, David Wheeler again and also an, uh, a coyote biologist who is going to, um, both of them, talk to us about uh, some coyote biology and how we can um, live in a world that has coyotes living in it. Um, I want to thank uh, County Executive Hughes and PSE and G for supporting this kind of work. And I also want to invite you to visit the Conserve Wildlife website and the Wildlife Center Friends websites. Their addresses are right there. So you can learn more about the amazing work that both of these organizations do in support of New Jersey wildlife. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. Um, we hope to see you again in our future programs and we really appreciate your time. Take care. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <clears throat>